This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All-Hit Radio! Welcome to the X-Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the X-Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I am your host, I am your guide, as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the X-Zone. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the X-Zone comes to you Monday through Friday from 11, uh, let's see, 11 p.m. until 3 a.m. on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. Radio X, Talkstar Radio Network, and on TalkStream Live, as well as many other affiliates and satellite programming providers. If you'd like to send an email, studio at exxoneradiotv.com and all social media sites, TV, and our website, where you can find out what we've done, what we're doing, and what we're planning to do at www.exxoneradiotv.com. My guest this hour, a good friend of the Exxon, everyone knows this name, Howard Bloom. And Howard is the author of the Rosetta Stone to what is happening in the, in, in the Middle East. It's called the Muhammad Code. And there's a brand new version that is out. But if you want to see more about Howard, find out the other great books that he has written. Read fascinating, fantastic articles. Find out who this guy is. It's going to blow your socks off. Go to www.howardbloom.net. And first of all, Howard, congratulations on the re-release of The Muhammad Code. I've had the pleasure of reading a third of it. Wow. Thanks, Rob. Well, it's a radical rewrite of the book. And it, it's, it's a book that, you, as you call it, the Rosetta Stone um, to Islamic terrorism. It's the book you need to read to understand what happened last Monday when one of the best people on planet Earth, a person you and I would have adored, um, an 18-year-old kid who had just graduated from community college, magna cum laude, with honors, a kid who his fellow students said always was prepared for class and always came up with the best questions, a person we would have adored, went out and tried to become a mass murderer at, a, mass murderer at Ohio State University. First, he tried to plow his car into a crowd and was mm-hmm. stopped by a concrete planter. 
Um, then he jumped out with a knife and tried to slash as many people as he could. He injured people. Fortunately, he didn't kill anybody. And in the end, he was killed. But what in the world turns a good, honest, hardworking person like that, uh, a person with a good heart, into a mass murderer? And to understand it, you really have to read the Mohammed Code, because the Mohammed Code is a story about Mohammed. And it's a story about not the Mohammed that you tend to read about in books by people like Mm -hmm. Karen Armstrong, who are apologists for Islam, who cover things up. But um, Mohammed was a very vicious man. He was a uh, military leader. He led 65 military expeditions. He personally took command. I mean, he was out in the battlefield in 27 of them, complete with his sword, his, his bow, and his arrow case, trying to kill as many of the enemy as he possibly could. He led Islam through a period of conquest in which it conquered 317 square miles of territory a day. He laid down the military system, the ideas, the military attitude that you saw in this 18-year-old in Ohio, and it's a military system that allowed his followers within 30 to 100 years of his death to take a territory 11 times the size of the conquests of Alexander the Great, five times the size of the Roman Empire, and seven times the size of the United States. You must read this book to understand who is attacking us today, who has been at war with us for almost 1,400 years. Howard, before you and I went, uh, came on air, uh, we were discussing, as we do, uh, many things, and um, you were saying that according to Fox News, um, you know, there is a chance of a major terrorist attack equaling to that of 9-11. Right. Fox News says that we're in the gravest danger of a terrorist attack since 9-11. But they are quoting a, uh, a congressional uh, panel. And congressional panels, now remember, I'm a Democrat, so yeah. I have a point of view here. But congressional panels over the course of the last eight years have been there to bludgeon Democrats, to either bludgeon Barack Obama or to bludgeon Hillary Clinton. Now, if Hillary Clinton is no longer an issue. They're still bludgeoning Barack Obama. So this panel's message, its central message, is that because we've had weak leadership against ISIS, um, terrorism is burgeoning. You and I have to go to our first break, Howard. Exonation Howard Bloom is our special guest. His website, where you can find out all about Howard and where you can get your very own copy of the Mohammed Code, is www.howardbloom.net. Listen, one quick uh, question to you. How would you like to be part of UFO history? If you said yes, go to www.cubesatfordisclosure.com. I'm Rob McConnell. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is Johanna Carroll, host of Dialogue with Divinity on the Exxon Broadcast Network. While walking along Kanapali Beach in Maui this past year, I kept discovering all these shells and coral in the shape of hearts. My Dialogue with Divinity was very simple. Do you want me to do a retreat to heal people's hearts in Maui next year? And of course, the answer was yes. As a master spiritual teacher, I am offering you a neat retreat called RISE, May 8th through the 12th, 2017, and the chance of a lifetime to rest at a five-star resort for five days and experience a spiritual renewal of your heart and soul. Kanapali is one of the top five beaches in the world. This stunning resort has undergone a $40 million renovation. I walked the entire property, checked out the room choices on your behalf, and I must say, it is stunning. Our conference room faces the ocean with sliding glass doors. Maui is known as Mother Maui because it is a soft, gentle, healing energy. In the embrace of Mother Maui, you will feel yourself rising from the limitations of an ordinary life to an extraordinary journey of peace, bliss, and harmony a greater sense of clarity. Our RISE retreat ignites renewal in the sacred elements of air, water, earth, fire, and wind. There's plenty of free time to enjoy all that Maui has to offer. A small deposit is required now to reserve your space as this retreat, it will sell out. 
For more details, please go to johannacarroll.com and register today. Aloha, and I'll see you in mystical Maui. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Welcome back, everyone. Howard Bloom is my special guest, www.howardbloom.net. He is the author of what I call the, the Rosetta Stone to understanding what is happening in this world of terrorism that we're looking at, the Muhammad Code. Visit www.howardbloom.net to buy your copy. You will not regret it. It is a great Christmas gift. Yeah, it's Christmas, all right? So let's, if, if somebody... If you know somebody who needs to know, if somebody who needs to get their 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 head wrapped around of what is really happening in this world of ours and why it's happening, to get the real story, www.hardbloom.net. The name of his latest book is The Muhammad Code, but he is the author of other great books, which all can be found at his website. Howard, um, let me see. You know, how do we... You know, there are so many phony news websites out there that have uh, that have come to light over the last little while. How do we know that, you know, here it is, post-election, a lot of people are not happy that President-elect Trump is where he is today. Uh, how do we know that this just isn't more bogus news? Something to... Well, it, it's very difficult these days, but uh, definitely if, if you see a story that you suspect is mm-hmm. bogus, go to RT. Um, just go online to RT. RT is an official Russian channel. Um, Putin, about a year ago, fired, it was an independent news channel. Putin fired its head and put one of his people in charge. So it's the voice of Putin. And if you want strange, bizarre stories, phony news, yeah. um, try this headline from three years ago when RT was already Putin's spokes, spokes mouth, right. but uh, wasn't yet under his direct control. Um, the, as, as the Syrian situation heated up, a headline in RT said that Barack Obama was trying to stir things up in Syria so he could land troops in Syria and march those troops from Aleppo and Damascus to Moscow to take over Russia. Now, does that sound like a realistic interpretation of Barack Obama's um, intentions? Hell no. You? Hell no. Yeah, so... If you read something that's deeply suspicious, mm-hmm. go on RT. If you see it on RT, there's a very good chance that it's false. Um, but the stuff about Islam is true. I mean, the other day I was in a debate uh-huh. with, my, with my editor, who's been extremely good to me, extremely good to me. And um, she gave me all kinds of information on Islam that I didn't know. And it was like erudite, you know, scholarly. And since I've spent, let's see, since 1959, I've been studying Islam. That's a long time. Um, I wondered where this information came from. She sent me the list of her sources today. It's all Westerners interpreting Islam. It's all Westerners quibbling about the history of Islam. If you want to know Islam, go to the sources. The sources are the Quran, which is an extremely confusing book, but it will give you a sense of things. 
go to the Hadith. The Hadith are even more confusing. Those are the sayings of Muhammad that have been recorded for all time. And, uh, and go especially to the two earliest biographers of Muhammad and of the rise of the Mohammedan community, the Islamic community. Their, their names are Ibn Ishaq and Al-Tabari. That's what I've done with this book. I have not gone to Western sources. I have gone directly to the basic Islamic sources that are considered holy. And I've given you the story of how Muhammad, who was a decent, upstanding citizen for a long time, turned into a mass murderer who loved to see others lose their heads, who loved to see the heads of others sawed off, who when one of his former neighbors, um, who had just been battling against him, was taken prisoner and came to him and said, Muhammad, you know my family, you know my daughters, what are they going to do without me? And Muhammad said simply, go to hellfire, and had the man's head struck off, to use the phrase from the Islamic sources, um, or at least the English translation of the phrase. Muhammad became a brutal, vicious man. He tolerated absolutely no dissent. If you said anything that he considered dissent against him, he had you murdered in the middle of the night. Um, when one person, um, there, there was a poet in Medina, the town where Muhammad was hanging out until he was able to take Mecca, and one of the women of the town wrote a, a poem saying that Muhammad, in a battle with the Meccans, had just killed the most generous and honorable men of Mecca, and that if this was uh, the way the earth was to be, the earth wasn't a safe place to live. Well, Muhammad took that rightfully as criticism. How did he respond? He said, who will rid me, rid me of Marwan's daughter? In other words, the woman who had written this. One of his men went to her bed in the middle of the night. She had five children took the baby off of her breast, took his sword, and plunged it all the way through her body and to the ground, to the ground below her. Wow. Um, and the next morning, he was racked with guilt. He thought maybe he had done the wrong thing, killing a mother of five children. And he went to Muhammad and said, Muhammad, am I going to be in trouble for this? Is this really what I should have done? And Muhammad said, basically, if it comes to killing a person who in any way is critical of me or doesn't follow me, you should know that the standing orders are kill them. That's what God wants you to do. And, um, and the world will no longer no more care about this woman than it will care about two goats butting their heads together in the meadow. So he was a vicious man who loved mass murder. He, he took a, uh, there was a town of Jews. He, he loved attacking towns of Jews. Um, it was a way to get rich quick, um, and the Jews they were simply not as numerous as his men work, were. Um, so he surrounded a town of Jews for 25 days until they finally gave up. They surrendered unconditionally. And then he had all of the men taken. He, he had them taken to the marketplace of Medina, which is the town, as I said, where he made his headquarters until he was able to take Mecca. And he sat there and had one of his men bring out a, a, a couple of men at a time and simply hack their heads off. Oh, now gosh. imagine that, Rob. Somebody hacking your head or my, my head off while we are still alive and feeling the pain, um, that's, that takes real mercilessness, absolute whatever, mercilessness. Whatever happened in his life to, to make him the twisted, power-seeking, hungry, uh, self-absorbed person that he ended up to be? Well, very much like Donald Trump. He reminds me sometimes of Donald Trump. He lost his father before he was born, mm -hmm. so he only had a mother. That is a severe disablement in an Arab community, um, because everything is pegged to your father. Your, your status is pegged to your father. Um, his mother died when he was six years old. That left him an orphan. Now, you know, kids are merciless to other kids with glasses, to other kids with funny names, yeah. certainly to other kids who were orphaned. It made him an other in his community. So we don't really know what happened to him as a child. But because he said that humor is a form of hostility, we can imagine the kids made fun of him, and that's why he perceived humor as hostility. Um, he was an upright, honorable man as a young man. He was renowned for the fact that you could trust him. If you, had, if you were going out on a... Mecca made its living in the transport business. So there were high-end transport goods coming in from India and China and arriving in Yemen, and the guys in Mecca had camel caravans and would pick up the goods from Mecca and take them over to the Mediterranean basin to Damascus and Syria and sell them for extremely high prices. Then they would come back with the money. And the trick was mm -hmm. to make it safely to, from Yemen to Damascus with these 
uh, ultra-luxury goods, and then to make it safely back with the money. Mohammed was known as the guy who, if you were going out on one of these merchant expeditions, you could leave your stuff with, and you would know that when you got back, none of it had disappeared, absolutely none of it. And he showed a talent for bringing people together, even though he was an outsider. So uh, there was an instance, there's this big meteoric stone, a big square stone, black, um, in Mecca. Um, uh, it's, it, it is a subject of, was a subject even before Islam of worship. And there was a square building built around it, which tribes from all around used to come and worship at. They kept their idols in this building. And the building was old and falling apart. So the Meccans decided to rebuild the building. They did it. And when the building was rebuilt, they were all struggling with each other over who would get the honor of putting the black stone back in its place. Muhammad came with a solution. He said, we'll put the black stone on a blanket, and each of the tribal leaders can hold an edge of the blanket. So they all got to lift the stone together. He had a gift for accommodating and putting people together. But as a youth, um, there, one of the uh, major Muslim authors on the topic says that war was a hobby among the Arabs before um, Muhammad came along. And that means that Muhammad, as a young man, went out to battle with his elders and picked up the arrows that had come in from the other side and gave them to the guys on his side to fire back at the enemy. So he was in battle where people were serious about killing each other um, from the time he was a youth. Now, being an outsider, um, having been the subject of ridicule, um, having experience in battle where battle was the norm and killing was the standard thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, those don't quite explain it because Muhammad became remarkably twisted and remarkably good at war. The first time he was attacked, um, well, when he moved off to this little tiny town of Medina, um, he had a problem. I mean, he, there, he had to pay off the people who were hosting he and his men. And he had to keep his men um, together. He had to keep them motivated. So he decided to attack the caravans that the Meccans were sending out. Um, now, there was a general rule in the desert. You do not attack caravans. Um, there was an even bigger rule, and that is during the season of Ramadan, you do not do anything. You do not kill people. You do not go out with weaponry. Muhammad broke all those rules and attacked caravans. And the Meccans, who owned these caravans, did not particularly appreciate the fact that their fellow Meccans were being killed um, and that they were being robbed of their goods, of, of their property. Understandably. So, yeah, so they got a group together. They called him the highwayman. Um, that's according to a Muslim source. That's not from a Westerner or from me. Um, and they decided to wipe out the highwaymen. So they got their troops together. Remember, they were well-schooled in war, how war was their hobby, and they went out to Medina, 280 miles, to wipe the guy out. Well, guess what? Muhammad, who had never organized a battle before, won. Hmm. He killed so many Meccans, it was ridiculous. So obviously he was good at war from the very beginning. He was schooled in war even before he took up arms and led his first troops in battle. But just to add insult to injury, this shows you the kind of guy Muhammad was. You have now just killed, if you've killed these incoming Meccans, your neighbors, you've just killed the people you grew up with. You've just killed the most famous men, the most uh, honest men, the most generous men, and the wisest men in the town that you came from. So what do you do with the bodies? If you're Muhammad, you throw them down a well to indicate that you have nothing but contempt for them. So Muhammad was not a nice guy. Not at all. There were a couple, when he finally did make it back into Mecca, um, he did it by, by, I told you, he took 700 Jewish men yep. and had them beheaded one by one in front of him. He did that in part not just to gain all of their loot. He was very big on loot. He was very big on the spoils of war, on all the things you could steal from people if you killed them. Um, but he did that to terrify the people in Mecca, so that when he showed up outside the gates of Mecca, they wouldn't even put up a fight. They would simply beg for the best terms possible to keep their lives and keep their heads on their bodies. So when he marched into Mecca under these conditions, there were a couple of slave girls. Now, the fact that you keep girls as slaves doesn't say a good thing about your society to begin with, right. but uh, certainly not, not about its treatment of women. But there were a couple of slave girls, singing girls they were called, and they sang a song that could be interpreted as, um, as mockery or as a satire 
on Muhammad's entering Mecca this way. Well, Muhammad ordered their death immediately. Oh. And when his men went to kill these, these beautiful young girls, the girls ran. They tried to get away. The men went after them with their battle steeds and, and stomped them, had their horses stomp them to death. All right, Howard, stand um, by. We've got to take a bit of a break here. Exonation Howard Bloom is our guest, www.howardbloom.net. He is the author of a great book, Ideal for Anyone for Christmas, The Muhammad Code. I'm Rob McConnell. I'll be back after this break. Whatever you do, don't go away. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at... Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying... So when we left off before the uh, news break at the bottom of the hour, Howard, you were telling us about uh, Muhammad and when he went to this city, um, the singing girls sang we're something, mocking him. were mocking him. And, and and he had them run down with uh, battle steeds. Um, he had them stomped to death wow. by the ho- hooves of horses. Young girls. Um, that 
Muhammad was, he gloried in being absolutely merciless. And then um, he made war. I told you he, he, um, he was the battle, he was the commander of 65 military campaigns. He mm-hmm. personally led 27 of them. I told you that he used to strap on his sword and his arrow case yeah. and his bow for these things. He wore two coats of chain mail. He took war very seriously. He captured 317 square miles of territory a day. And then in uh, 629 A.D., a long time ago, um, Muhammad basically let it be known that Islam's goal was to take over the world, not to take over a little patch of territory in the Middle East, not to take over all of Saudi Arabia, not to take over the city of Mecca, but Mm -hmm. to take everything, everything that existed on the face of planet Earth. Why? Because God made this earth, he said, from a clot of mud. And God made us humans from a clot of blood. So surely we all belong to God. And since the messages that Muhammad was receiving and giving out to his community were direct messages from God, direct communiques, um, and they were complete with a whole set of rules, of rules about how to lead your life, a judicial code, a military code, um, everything that you need in life. Uh, Muhammad, Muslim scholars call it a complete system of life. They say that Islam is not a religion as we conceive it in the West. Not at all. It is a complete system of life. It even tells you what direction to turn when you urinate. Um, wow. So, so since all of this came directly from God mm-hmm. through Muhammad, and it, thus it was God's own law, and shouldn't the world that God made and the humans that God fashioned be ruled by God's own law and well, only by God's well, own law? Well, did course. anybody ever think that they were listening to the ramblings of a madman who was actually hearing yes. voices in his head? Uh, yes. Uh, when uh, Muhammad in 629 A.D. sent out his letters to the emperors. He sent out letters to the six biggest mm-hmm. empire emperors in the world that he knew. The only one he missed out on was the emperor of China, and God knows how he missed him. Um, and Muhammad's letter said, I invite you to Islam, but unfortunately, if you do not accept my invitation, I will be forced to take other means, because remember, if you don't accept Islam, you are uh, condemning the souls of uh, millions of people to hell. And hell is nasty and vicious and mean. Um, so it's my responsibility to make sure that you see the proper way and that you live according to God's own laws. Well, these emperors did not take Muhammad seriously. One of them um, was Her- Her- Hercules. Um, he was the emperor of Rome, but the new Rome. Rome had moved from Rome to the new Rome. The new Rome was Byzantium. So he was the head of the, what we now call the Byzantine Emperor Empire, which was really the Roman Empire. Um, at any rate, um, Heracles, as he was known in the local lingo, um, turned to his counselors and said, who is this letter from? Who is this guy? And uh, his counselors said, your majesty, he is from a people of sheep and camels. You will never hear of him or them again. Do not worry about it. Well, um, that was bad advice. Yeah. Because within uh, roughly, it was about 15 years of Muhammad's death, there were two superpowers at the time, two mm-hmm. equivalents to the United States and what the Soviet Union used to be back in the days of the Cold War. Um, one of them was the Persian Empire, the other one was the Roman Empire. Um, Islam took the, per- the entire Persian Empire within roughly 15 years of Muhammad's death. How? By following his example of mercilessness by following his example of utter commitment to killing other people. Muhammad said, if I were able to go into battle and be killed, then come to life again and go back into battle and be killed again, then, then once again uh, be resurrected and go back to battle and kill once again for Allah's pleasure, it would be the greatest pleasure in the world for me. And that helps explain something like what I'm about to read you. The, the kid, the 18-year-old at Ohio State, the attacker last Monday, was named Abdul Razak Ali Artan, and he left a message on Facebook, um, which the press really covered up for the most part, um, before he died. And he said, in the name of Allah, the most merciful and the most gracious, my brothers and sisters, I am sick and tired of seeing my Muslim brothers and sisters being killed and tortured everywhere, seeing my fellow Muslims being tortured, raped, and killed in Burma, led to a boiling point. I can't take it anymore. America, stop interfering with other countries, especially the Muslim Ummah. We are not weak. We are not weak. Remember that. If you want us Muslims to stop carrying out lone wolf attacks, then make peace with ISIS. Make a pact or a treaty with them where you promise to leave them alone, you and your fellow apostate allies. 
by Allah, we will not let you sleep unless you give peace to the Muslims. You will not celebrate or enjoy any holiday. Stop the killing of Muslims in Burma. By the way, he says, every single Muslim who disapproves of my actions is a sleeper cell waiting for a signal. I am warning you, O America, and a message to the Muslims. Don't listen to celebrity scholars who sold their holiness. Beware of the Al-Maghreb Institute. Listen instead to our hero, Imam Anwar al-Aliki. That's a man who has inspired many, many attacks. Back to this statement. Let me ask you this question. If Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, and his companions were here today, wouldn't the Western media call them terrorists? To conclude, by Allah, I am willing to use a billion infidels in retribution. In other words, he is saying, I'm willing to kill, I, meaning me, and on behalf of the Islamic people, we are willing, that is, the, he's talking only for the, the terrorists among mm-hmm. them, only for the jihadists, right. but I am willing to use a billion infidels. He means we are willing to kill a billion people in retribution. And every single Muslim who disapproves of my actions is a sleeper cell waiting for a signal. Why? Because Muhammad's example is the measure of righteousness and purity. If you really want to be righteous and just and proper, you require to follow what steps someone step, step, by step. Muhammad was a killer out with a simple mission to take the entire world through bloody conquest. And that is ultimately what those who study Islam deeply, especially the Islam not all of Islam, but the Islam that's being preached by in, in the magazine Dabiq, which right. is the magazine of ISIS, the Islamic State, that is being preached by Al-Qaeda, that is being preached by Boko Haram. Their Islam is based on the warrior example, the merciless example, the cruel example of Muhammad himself, an example that, that gloried in genocide, because that's what Muhammad knew he was carrying out in that Jewish village, was a genocide where he had every single male slaughtered. And genocide, if you look at the works of the Ayatollah Khomeini, the guy who founded modern Iran, he is proud of that genocide. He says that we have been forced to put many a tribes to death, to annihilate them utterly, in order to uh, safeguard the purity of Islam. This is one of the major interpreters of Islam of the modern era. He, he is the George Washington of Iran. His words are considered holy for all practical purposes um, in Iran today. So there are Muslims who do not see the side of Muhammad at all, and they are decent, loving, um, pluralistic, tolerant, modernist people, and they are among some of my dearest friends. But they do not dare speak out against the murderers, the terrorists, the monsters, um, those who want to model themselves on Muhammad's warrior example. That's the essential message of the Muhammad Code, but the Muhammad Code tells the story, and I am told that it tells it in a chilling and a thrilling way. Way. Let me ask you a question. Uh, with uh, Trump taking over the reins in Washington after he'd uh, drained the swamp, what do you think is going to happen when it comes to the United States versus ISIS with the new commander-in-chief? This is a tricky thing. I think the new commander-in-chief, he has universal respect. He has respect from the Democratic side. He has respect from the Republican side. He's known as the warrior monk. He is known to uh, go out and, and take guard posts on holidays with his troops so that some man can go home and spend the time with his family. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has sense. And, uh, and so far as we can see at this point, Donald Trump will listen to him. The fact is that that congressional committee that said we're under the greatest threat since uh, 9-11 yeah. and that said that Barack Obama has shown weak leadership, they're dead wrong. We have ISIS almost exterminated at this point. We are driving them out of Mosul, which is the biggest city that they possess, and we are already on the edge of their capital, um, forces of um, uh, Kurds. But is this, going um, to, is this going to put the United States and all the allies into a false sense of security where this may, now as funny as this or as strange as this may sound, but I, I, you know, I, I, I look at this and say, well, maybe this is why they're doing it as a diversion while they actually set up for major attacks elsewhere in the world. Well, I don't think so, uh, because ISIS can't afford to lose that territory. That is their caliphate. And if they lose it, that means the caliphate is going to have a very hard time claiming it's a caliphate. And it's going to have a very hard time claiming that God is on its side. Meanwhile, today, 
Obama made his final security statement. And that statement said, don't expect an end to this war if we get rid of Mosul uh, and if we take over Raqqa. This is going to go on for a long time to come. Now, he is not a student of Islam. In fact, he's been, Obama has been very misled about what Islam is. He doesn't know this warrior aspect of Muhammad's own life. He thinks that it's Islamophobia. He's wrong. Um, this is all that I'm telling you is from Islamic texts. It is not from Western authorities. So it's right from the camel's Islam. mouth, kind of. Yeah, all exactly. Right. Uh, and what um, o- Obama said is, yes, we're going to be in this for a long time to come. What he doesn't realize is, ever since 629 A.D., Muhammad declared war on the world in 629 A.D., and that war has been going on ever since. It abated a little bit when Islam lost its strength in the 1800s, um, but it's only abated for a total of 150 years out of the 1400 years in which Islam has been aligned against every other religion in the world. It is just as much as, much against Buddhism as it is against Christianity. Um, although it, it reserves a special place for the Jews, the Jews are its very special enemy. Why? Because Muhammad built his wealth in the beginning, and he built his conquests and his victories by taking on people who could not defend themselves, uh, innocent towns of Jews. So Jews have remained the sons of pigs and monkeys, according to the Koran, ever since. Anti-Semitism is deeply built into the fiber of Islam. But my friends in the Muslim community support me more than any supporters I have in the United States, and they are dear to me. And whenever I get to spend time with them in a group, I ask them to please raise their voice against the militants among them, and they don't dare because they don't want to have their throats slit. People, There are two women who have gone for a renaissance, who have gone for a reformation in Islam. They are um, Ayan Hirsi Ali, um, at, who spends some time at Harvard these days, um, is a former Dutch um, uh, a member of the Dutch uh, Assembly, but she had to flee from Holland. Um, she made a film about the plight of women in Islam. She was raised in Somalia. She was raised as a good Muslim, um, and she managed to escape. And she made a film with Theo Van Gogh, and you probably recall what happened to Theo Van Gogh as a result of that film. He was carved to pieces. Um, somebody tried to cut his head off and then pinned a manifesto to his chest that read very much like the manifesto that I just read you from this kid at Ohio State. Um, so the, she is going for a Muslim reformation. She wants the positive side of Muhammad to be stressed and the negative side to be, to be eliminated. And she's under merciless attack in the Islamic community. Howard Bloom is my guest, www.howardbloom.net. He is the author of The Muhammad Code. And we'll be back as we wrap up this hour here in the X-Zone on the other side of this break from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. 
Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Howard Bloom is my guest, www.howardbloom.net. For the first uh, three quarters of this hour, we talked about Howard's great book, The Mohammed Code. It's available at howardbloom.net. But Howard, let's talk about President-elect Um Trump, Air Force One. What's the scoop? Well, on Air Force Air Force One. The deal is that uh, Boeing was the old Air Force One uh, is a very old plane. It's about forty years old, and because it's so old, it's impossible to get spare parts when something goes wrong. Mm-hmm. So every repair costs a fortune because uh, the new part has to either be salvaged from some old plane or it has to be built from scratch. Um, and, and it's, you know, that's only sustainable for so long. Um, so there's been a plan to build a new Air Force One. Now, Air Force One is more than just your average Boeing jet. Um, it's armored. It uh, has anti-missile defenses. Um, it's built for all kinds of communication facilities that normal planes don't have. Um, it's a very fancy deal. And Boeing was supposed to build one of these. Now, so far, Boeing has only been given $175 million dollars to study the deficiencies with sticking with the old plane. That's an awful lot of money to study the deficiencies of the old plane. I would think um, so. But it's a typ- yeah, it's a typical military way of 
getting somewhere. So Donald Trump has said, look, this plane is going to cost $4 billion. I'm going to cancel it. Um, actually, it's going to cost $3.1 billion, but he's in the right ballpark, and it is an awful lot of money. And the way that the military procures things is just loaded with so much pork that we vastly overpay for things. So he's got a point. On the other hand, mm -hmm. what are you going to do for the next Air Force One? If you use Donald Trump's plane, Trump charges, he has charged all through the, um, the campaign, the presidential campaign, for Secret Service men flying on his plane. So he's charged the U.S. government about $1.5 million so far, and that money goes to a Trump company whose profits go to Donald Trump and his family. Um, if the Trump plane is used as, on a regular basis as Air Force One, it doesn't have the armor, it doesn't have the anti-missile facilities, it doesn't have the radiation shielding, which is very important because Air Force One is, is there to keep the president safe in case there's a nuclear attack. Um, it doesn't have any of the things that Air Force One needs to keep the president safe. Um, and the profits go directly into Donald Trump's pocket. So one big question has been, how, does, how do we separate Donald Trump's personal business interests from the presidency of the United States? Well, as far as um, his own jet is concerned, he hasn't been separating those interests. So what are the alternatives to a plane from Boeing? How about a plane from Airbus? It's the only major competitor. That puts jobs, it takes jobs out of the United States and put, like, pays for jobs in Europe. That's not a great deal. Plus, uh, Airbus did not even compete with Boeing when the bid came up, the bidding came up for Air Force One, because they didn't want to go through all the trouble of doing all these fancy things with one of their planes. They just wow. weren't interested. Um, so Boeing is the only company interested in making a new Air Force One. Now, if we give them enough time, China, which is already building its own stealth fighter jets, will build a nice big plane. Do we want to ship jobs to China? Well, that's been Donald Trump's perpetual habit up until now, hasn't it? Um, but no, I don't think Donald Trump would dare do that in the presidency. So he's, he's making what Donald Trump does, does is make big, flashy, headline-grabbing, Twitter-grabbing moves um, that will send a symbolic message. And the symbolic message this time is, I'm not going to put up with any of that garbage of overpacking yeah. every single project with pork anymore. That's a good message. That's a necessary message. But is there a practical solution uh, to this problem? And is there a Trump profit here, a Trump way of siphoning money from the pocketbooks of consumers? Oh, I forgot to turn the sound on my phone off. No, it's okay. Hang on. It's all right. Let me... Um, <laughs> oh, God. So at any rate... Um, the problem is that the money will go into the money could easily go into Trump's pop profit pocket, and he could make a he could this could show the beginning of a pattern he, that it, takes a yes, guy. Yes, but this is hypothetical who, at this point. We don't know right. for a fact that he's going to do it. So what we're doing is no, he just he tweeted. Yeah. So we're extrapolating from sure. a tweet. However, tweets are are the most direct form of communication that the president uses, and he mm -hmm. uses them to end run the press. And to talk directly to you and me. Okay, so I've got a guy. I'd like to. I'd like to throw a throw something at you. This this entire thing with Jill Stein and the recounts. Is she nuts? No, um, she only got one percent of the vote. And if you only got one percent of the vote, or I only got one percent of the vote, she's a and poor we loser. To increase that to five percent, we'd go for every bit of publicity we she's could. A, she, and, you know, she's a poor loser. She's an old hag, for God's sake. But. Remember, um, as of a count four days ago, yeah. Hillary Clinton was ahead in the popular vote by 2.5 million votes. Yeah, that is a serious challenge to the legitimacy of Donald Trump. Well, no, that because that vote. that had the the popular vote has nothing to do with the electoral vote, and the election yep, is based on electoral. However, if you go back to the Constitution, uh -huh. the Electoral College was formed for the purpose of getting a bunch of wise men, totally independent mm -hmm. of party to make a judgment about who is the most fit to be president. Well, let's see. And who would you like, a criminal or a business person who can actually do some good for the country? I'll, I, I'll pick well, the businessman. Yeah, you know me. I'll take the criminal. But although I don't th really think she's a criminal. Oh, I come on, of, Howard. Uh, of a smear campaign that's oh, no, on no, 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 no. Look, Trump got elected fair and square. He's going to be the president of the United States. He's going to do great things. We hope. <laughs> Some of us are praying. Yeah, well, you know, Even I atheists like me. You know, I, I look at the glasses always half full, never half empty. Right. 
Well, I hope he does some good things. As I said, there is a positive aspect to this mm-hmm. Boeing message, and it's that I will not tolerate this kind of pork anymore, however I might say, from money into my own pocket. Um, so it's a tricky message, but you know that uh, having been involved with the space community for yeah. a long time, the American space manned space program has been killed by a rocket that is nothing but pork. It's called the, uh, the Space Launch System. It's known informally in the space community as the Senate Launch System. It is costing $3 billion a year to merely develop this monster rocket, and Elon Musk has developed a similar rocket for $2 billion total. Sure. Not $3 billion in a year, not a total of $30 billion, for $2 billion. Hey, Elon so, Musk is one heck of a great guy. Oh, he's an amazing he deliverer. He, he makes things happen. Um, so, but the point is, Donald Trump is right that there is too much pork in Washington, and that pork is bleeding this country of hundreds of billions of dollars. And if he manages to diminish that, um, if he manages to get us better goods, uh, better quality weapons for less money, better quality rockets for less money, that, that's what Elon is already doing, um, then we will all be grateful. Sure. I understand that Joe Biden has said that, you know, he hasn't r- uh, ruled out a run for the presidential uh, election in 2020. Yeah, I saw that headline, too, but I didn't have a, ch- a chance to check into it. He's a popular guy, but... What the Democratic Party, my party, doesn't get is that it doesn't stand for anything right now. Um, and, and it needs to stand for more than better together. Um, better together doesn't really mean that much. Um, I mean, we need to show up. My slogan for the Democratic Party um, would be America must lead. We must lead the world in technology. We must lead the world in job creation. We must lead the world in reinventing what jobs are all about. We must lead the world in reinventing productivity. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are the means to outdo the Chinese, Um, not simply taking jobs. But you saw today that that there was an announcement. Trump met with uh, the head of uh, SoftBank in Japan. And this is an incredibly successful tycoon worth billions and billions of dollars who built a huge fortune by making, by seeing the big picture and making very good long-term guesses about the future. And this guy is talking about making a $50 billion investment in the United States, um, half of which would come from China, that would allegedly create 50,000 jobs. If that happens, and apparently that deal was in the works before Donald Trump ever showed up on the scenes, but Donald was claiming credit for it, one way or the other, if it happens, it's good for America. Yeah. Um, apparently, he's causing diplomatic waves, uh, especially by inviting the the um, head honcho of the Philippines to the United States. Well, he's causing them all over the place. Um, he said wonderful, wonderful things on a phone call to the head of Pakistan. Pakistan uh, is has a nearby enemy, India. Yeah. India has 1.2 billion people, um, of as many as about four to five Pakistans. And the, the Indians have got to be shuddering in their socks that he got in touch with Pakistan before he got in touch with them. And we have better relationships, a better relationship with India than we do with Pakistan. Pakistan is on the Chinese payroll, basically. Um, he, he talked to the president of Taiwan. Uh, the Chinese, there's been a policy ever since 1979 that we do not talk directly to the uh, head of Taiwan we agree with the Chinese the, with the one China policy. I regard that as cowardice on our part. Uh, Taiwan was an ally of ours for a very, very long I time. Thought so yeah, and and yeah, and and um, Trump broke with that cowardly position. Now he said, "Oh, it was only a casual phone call. She was only calling me to wish me luck." But all the evidence indicates that this call was in the works, being planned for weeks before it actually happened. So he's, you know, him. He likes to unsettle people. He likes to keep them in suspense, Mm -hmm. Um, and he's doing that right now to the Chinese. And the Chinese are being very calm about it so far. But the situation with Duterte, Duterte, the the new dictator of the Philippines, is a monster. He's asked his people to go out in the streets, and if they see anybody who's accused of drug dealing, shoot them down immediately. Yeah, I love that idea. No no idea they might be innocent. which means that if you have a beef with somebody and you want to get back at them, you can simply claim they're a drug dealer and whammo. They're gone. They're out. Hey, speaking about gone and out, I hate to do this, old friend, but we've run out of time for tonight. Howard Bloom is our guest. Howard, congratulations on the updated Mohammed Code and ExoNation Christmas time. 
visit Howard's website, www.howardbloom.net. Take care of yourself, my good friend. Look forward to the next time we chat. Thanks, Rob. Have a great night. You too, partner. I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Excel from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Thank you.